<laughs> so, my name is Denis Derrick. Thank you very much for attending my uh, talk. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to have this opportunity to present the work of my lab to um, Blender User Fellows. Um, I'm going to start with a few words about Alice Lab, which is a teaching and research unit from the Faculty of Architecture of the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. Um, we are interested in um, graphic representation and the formal composition of architecture, so shapes, um, basically. Um, we are a tiny research unit. We are about eight to 10 people, academics, researcher, PhD students, and today I'm just the tip of the iceberg. The work I'm going to present today is a research that was undertaken with colleagues and students. It involves quite a lot of people. Um, we, the, the lab was created in, in 1994. Um, so we've been around for a while and um, we were in Autodesk before and 12 years ago we decided to quit Autodesk and to switch to Blender. And it was like trying to quit smoking, some sort of bad habit you have to get rid of, but after a while it was such a relief. Um, the, what specifies our approach is that we're not interested in the means of production of architecture, we stick to a ther more uh, theoretical field. Um, so we, we use no CAD software because they always rely on some sort of theory that is never stated and that orient the production. So that's why we decided to use Blender, it's totally open. You can hack it and you can uh, like think more freely. This is an example of uh, students' works where we try to generate architectural shape based on Python scripting. And so we, we try to generate shape with some sort of randomness and it's combined with uh, 3D printing. Um, this is another example of when you try to hack things. Um, it's the talk of Julien. That was on Wednesday, it's about oblique projection, which is a very basic projection in architecture that pretty much no program does. So we, we did our add-on to fix that. Um, and another example, when we talk of hacking, that is specific to our approach, is that we design a, a machine that allows us to print digital drawing with whatever tool we want on whatever support we want. So we try to explore some uncharted territories between digital drawing and analog drawing and try to open the field of research instead of like optimizing production. Um, we are also interested in the um, built heritage. Um, so those are students drawing about um, iconic buildings in Belgium. So we try to analyze uh, historic building and we also use, um, we survey, we 3D survey uh, existing buildings. So we, we have pictures, we generate pond clouds, and we retrieve the pond clouds in Blender, and it handles the pond clouds very well. So in that context, every now and then, we are commissioned uh, to study iconic buildings, um, mostly in Brussels. Uh, so um, the past six years, we've been working on two major projects. The first one is the restitution of the Maison du Peuple, House of the People, Volkshaus, um, from Victor Horta. And another one, which is the Palais Stoclet, also in Brussels, um, from the uh, Austrian architect, Joseph Hoffmann. And through uh, those projects, we came up with a workflow fully hosted in Blender, um, where we try to account for the scientific value of the 3D restitution hypothesis because um, realistic 3D images tell a very convincing story about something that is generally full of uncertainty. So that's what is beyond the narrative, um, some sort of contradiction that needs to be cleared up. Um, just, I'm going to swiftly present both of the, the case studies. This is the Maison du Peuple. Um, so the, the Belgian Workers' Party commissioned Victor Horta uh, at the end of the 19th century to design a building that would, ho that would host the, 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 the party itself, 
plus some facilities for the working class so they could, they could afford uh, basic products. Um, and the main feature of the building was a great conference room that was at the top of the building, like a, a zeppelin hanging up in, hanging up in the air. Um, in 1965, the Belgian Workers' Party was the Socialist Party. It was a huge institution, and uh, the building was no longer matching their requirements. So they sold the building and it was knocked down. Uh, well, that was the 60s, everybody was looking towards the future, not towards the past, and it was not considered heritage worth keeping. So that's the end of the story. Um, the other building, Palais Stoclet, is still in Brussels in quite a good shape. Um, it's listed as UNESCO heritage, but it's private property. Meaning that even if we were commissioned by the Ministry of Urbanism, we couldn't enter it. We even did the research in the middle of a legal dispute. Um, so we had like a lawyer's letter piling up on our desk. Uh, so it was kind of hard to focus, but thankfully we were backed up by the legal department of the university for their just daily job. Um, but yeah, so we, only, we could only work on this building that was in front of us only on public archives, which is a very Belgian story. Um, so the, this is a house of a banker, a um, very rich banker. So there's luxury everywhere, and the, the architect designed the, from the building to the teaspoon. Everything is designed by the architect. And uh, the building was also hosting a collection of art. So this is a mosaic from Gustav Klimt. Um, so let's jump into the workflow. Um, every restitution hypothesis starts with a, by collecting archival sources and by sorting them out according to different criteria. Um, first is the nature of the source. So it can be photos, books, newspapers, audio, video, or remaining parts that we 3D survey. It could be, another way to sort them out, could be what part of the building they describe, or uh, the date. So because we are always looking for a specific uh, state of the building, uh, the, the, the pristine state, what we call, so the, the building as it was designed by the architect, because often they were remodeled. Um, so we have the sources, and then we analyze the sources, and we start building the 3D restitution hypothesis. So this is not a two-step process when we start with the archives and end up with a 3D model, but more a recurrent process where the 3D model is the core. Um, so we form a hypothesis all along the process, and the, the 3D model serves as a basis to question itself. So there's a, a back and forth relationship between the model, the archives, and the committee experts, uh, the expert committee through which the main hypothesis builds up. And for instance, this is the study of the marble of uh, the dining room of the Palais de Clay. This is with the mosaic. Um, and yes, the, 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 the process is recurrent, and we, it always needs to, keep, to remain open for uh, new sources and also for unknown sources, because there might be some new information that might turn up. And in the end, a 3D restitution hypothesis is just a snapshot and, uh, of a state of knowledge. It's just when we run out of time, when we run out of money, with the deadlines running, we have to stop. But it doesn't mean that the project is over. Um, so we make, we make decisions all along the, the process, and some, high, some are uh, highly speculative, which is not a problem as long as it's mentioned. So we need to speculate if we, because there are a lot of things that we don't know. So if we, if we want to fill the gaps, we need to speculate. And what makes the scientific value of the work is that everything is thoroughly documented. So every decision is traceable and is connected to its sources. So to cut it short, um, we have heterogeneous sources from heterogeneous nature, and we extract information and we like do the synthesis of those information in a homogeneous media, which is a 3D model, and we document all the process. Um, so in this relationship between the sources, the, the archives, and the 3D restitution hypothesis, we can create an inventory for each element of the criteria under study. Uh, here, I'm going to stick to two criteria, which is the geometry and the color, to keep it simple, and then the nature of the source. And then we have those lists. Um, of 
sources and for different, the, the different nature of the source, this, this is the major influence on the certainty of the hypothesis. Um, why am I talking about geometry and color? Is because according to the criteria in the study, the certainty can, be, can really be different. Um, so those are the structures of the um, café of the Maison du Peuple. And the structures were kept and integrated in another building. So we could 3D survey them, plus we had a lot of pictures, pictures from the destruction of the building, historic pictures, plans, drawings, all, a lot of sources converging to the same description. So we, we know that we are fairly confident of the accuracy of those structures, so we can integrate them in the 3D model, and yes, we are, uh, we are quite confident that that's how they were. That's for the geometry. When it comes to the color, there's no living soul who could witness uh, about how it was back in the days, and we only have black and white pictures. Plus, the, the, the building was remodeled several times, and the structures were repainted, and before being integrated, they were sandblasted. So we have pretty much nothing. And the architect destroyed his archives before his death. So in this case, what we have is a paragraph in a newspaper and a letter from the architect to his contractor. So when we propose this restitution for the colors, the degree of confidence and degree of certainty is definitely not the same. Um, so for each 3D element, there's an evaluation of the degrees of certainty and a conversion to a color chart. When it go greenish, yellowish, it's high certainty. When it goes brownish, it's um, less certainty. And then what we do is we 3D map the, the degrees of certainty on the 3D model itself so as to like, acknowledge for the, the degrees of certainty of the, the, each 3D elements. That's for the geometry. It goes greenish, we're quite confident. That's for the color. So what we know is that we don't know much, um, even if, like, if it's a building that was destroyed 60 years ago. Um, so this is the workflow that we have now. It's um, a, a workflow where the, the 3D restitution serves as a map, as a, as a, as a th we, we can like inject the information of the degrees of certainty so as to represent um, the degrees of certainty based on the 3D model. And that's what we're trying to turn in, a, in an add-on. Um, so at this point, it's, it's an embryonic state which is like connects the, the 3D element to the source and we generate a list, but we normally have the findings to to achieve that in the upcoming years. Um, so that's what we want to, that the process that we want to automate is to the filters to see beyond the narratives um, because somehow this image is a fairy tale. Um, we don't know much. Uh, so um, yeah, it's paramount to see this image through those filters. There are more filters than that. I just kept it through uh, simple criteria, um, but that's what, what we want to make explicit through this, this workflow. Now I'm going to say a few words about the project themselves. This is the concrete tower that replaced the Maison du Peuple, and we managed to fly a drone over the district and to get a point cloud. Um, and also we completed the point cloud with a ground survey, then you see the the, the, the flight of the drone uh, with the GPS, so it just it lifts off, and then you see it flying around, you don't see it, and you hope that it's going to come back. And it came back. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite stressful. Uh, you need a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork before flying a drone over the area, because it was shortly after the terrorist attack, so it was not easy. Um, and so we had this spawn cloud, and we got rid uh, the concrete tower, and we put the Maison du Peuple instead. Um, and we took for granted that um, it was never destroyed because the, the whereabouts were different back in the days. And remodeling Brussels was not a budget. So we just stick to this simple solution. Um, so this allowed to create those rides where we discover the building. As for clemency, um, we are architects and researchers doing CGI 
Um, I know that we're doing our best, we're kind of proud of it, but I know that the level that I've seen those past two days uh, in terms of architectural rendering can, can go beyond this, yet um, we're still happy with this. So the big red flags were at the top of the building, red flag of the Socialist Party. Here's another ride. Um, this one where we swap the, the Maison du Peuple with the, the, the tower that is now uh, where it used to sit. I'm not sure it's an improvement. Um, the cafe. Corridors. A meeting room or a conference room called the Salle Blanche, Salle Matteotti. And this was the most challenging part, which is the, uh, the Great Hall. Uh, was a lot of research in terms of geometry and um, in terms of yeah, colors plus rendering time, um, that was yeah, the, the most challenging part. So those are the spaces that we have studied so far. Uh, only the main spaces, we are the, the, those are the most documented, but you see all the wire that remains, there's still a lot of work. Um, plus, we could like rework some of the spaces because we know that um, some parts are uh, inaccurate um, because we found out some new sources. Um, this is the point cloud, the only point cloud that we have of the Palais Stoclet. There's not much I can show about the Palais Stoclet for legal reasons, um, but this is the only point cloud that we could generate uh, through pictures taken from public space. So like a few meters away and try to take a few pictures and was used only for measurements. Um, because the rest were the, the, the 3D modeling of the Palais de Clay was only undertaken based on archives. So this is how it was. No, there's a quite an urban motorway in front of it. Um, this is the main space, so full of marble and gold. Where on the one hand, we had the house of the people. On the other hand, we had the, the house of a banker. It was kind of funny. Um, this is Klimt's mosaic in the dining room. There's work on the texture to, to have a, the glittering effect. Um, and I'm going to conclude with this image um, and a small anecdote um, about the structures of the, the Great Hall. So there was a big debate within the expert group about the color of the structure. Um, some, were convinced, some were convinced that it was red, the color of the Socialist Party, and it was always taken for granted that they were red. And then some other expert came up with another idea, is that all the descriptions, the written descriptions uh, about the color of the structure were written before the inauguration of the building. And what they saw for them is what Antiros paint. And for some reasons, very consistent line of thinking, they came up with the, uh, this idea that they were uh, gray bluish, fine for us. Um, and because the deadline was drawing near, we had to present the research to the public. We had to make a decision because for the big ride, there was a lot of rendering time. So yeah, we, we had to make a decision. So we decided it would be grayish, fine. And then a few months after the project was released, someone told us about a letter from the French painter Paul Tignac, who visited the Maison du Peuple shortly after its inauguration. And he mentions the structure of the Great Hall. And they mentioned this color, and they were red. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.